Well, hello, creatives, community, and kind folks out there. Welcome to RPG with DBJ. I am your host, DBJ, and on this channel, Monday through Friday, for about an hour, we have an unscripted um, talk with uh, just about everyone. And usually there's a subject. Today's subject, and this week's subject, is the caldera. Um, the, the idea of an a lake inside of a volcano and so we're going to talk about it all week long now we usually subdivide that down so today is discord tuesday and um on discord tuesday we tend to talk about mechanics in our tabletop rpgs and we take that subject and that's what we talk about but to let everyone um know about how you can interact with uh with this channel you can interact on it uh, interact with this channel in three ways. You can go over to the Twitch channel and uh, go over there. You can hang out there with us live. You can go over to um, our YouTube channel and you can join the um, Discord server. So uh, you can interact uh, all three ways and if possible, yes, your comment will uh, will appear on the show or at least, <laughs> at least I'll interact with such things as we talk about our subject. So <laughs> Yeah, be, before the show starts, um, I usually go on a little uh, little rambly tirade kind of thing in the Discord server, so if you join the Discord, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So anyway, so yesterday uh, on Monster Monday, we did talk about um, calderas and the, the what I had, my personal love of the idea of a caldera is that you, you really get a good sense of like the four classic... Uh, elemental forces. Um, you have uh, high altitudes in air, clouds, storms. Um, heck, you can even, even throw like uh, poisonous gases and things of that nature in there. Um, we have uh, we have earth because essentially, of um, for the most part, volcanic activity tends to be uh, at least on a on land. Um, huge mountains, mounds uh, piercing up through into the sky. Sometimes tall enough to uh, to um, be as tall as some of the highest mountains and such. And then, of course, we have the water portion of it, where the the upper portion, the upper bowl of our um, volcano, our caldera, is filled with a, a lake. It could either be pristine with, with um, uh, breathable air and places for us to have our adventures, maybe a couple of islands in the middle, uh, maybe a community living around the bowl area, whatnot. And of course, we have the fire portion, which is, of course, the volcanic activity itself. Now, of course, there would it couldn't necessarily be a very violently active volcano, um, but volcanic activity is there, so we can pull on that and pull on those strings. So mechanically, what I feel is that we can have a lot of fun with mixing and matching some of uh, and reskinning some of our uh, potential monsters and adversaries as well as the environment and I will even go so far as even like spell like effects if you're using like uh, your your some Dungeons and Dragons by mixing and matching some of the elemental forces and movement rates and things because you have um, all four elemental forces engaged and so here's here's what I mean the the idea is that for example with monsters maybe you have an aquatic monster um, and so something that already has a swimming speed you can throw into that lake you know uh, anything from like merfolk all the way up to like a kraken or a few <laughs> um, but they may also have some other trait related to the other uh, the other elemental forces like for example maybe that aquatic creature also has a burrowing speed to burrow into the subterranean portions or maybe that aquatic creature does have a flying speed and can uh, take to the air or something like that right mm -hmm. might even have some kind of uh, it's possible ooh, some kind of resistance <laughs> yeah tesla ranger puts in um the, the Fire Nation cap, uh, an image of the Fire Nation capital on our Discord server, and uh, excellent art and a and a cool um, a cool shout out to um, to uh, Airbender, right? The Fire Nation capital, also also known as Capital City, is the seat of the government for the Fire Nation. It is home to the Fire Lord, the Fire Nation royal family, and Fire Nation nobility. And 
just looking at that, looking at the image that was uh, portrayed, you can see that that jagged edge on the outside and the community on the inside. So we talked about the fact that a if it's possible to create a community in, in a fantasy world inside of a caldera, it it becomes its own defensive measure. You know, you can base essentially from um, any point around the outer circumference, you may be able to see enemies approach from any direction. You don't have to build walls that already exist. You have a, uh, depending on how big the volcano is, of course, you, you're, you know, if you're designing your own setting, you can make it as big or small as you want. But um, also you're not limited to the lengths at which people would be able to construct a wall of that size and diameter and height. Uh, you already, it's basically like living inside of a crater, even in science fiction. We see crater cities, right? And it's the exact, it's used for the same uh, purposes. And then, of course, uh, whatever land and or water is on the inside, whether it's just a couple of small lakes and uh, water features like it is in this um, image that I'm looking at, or the entire thing is flooded and you can only live on an outer basin, or any combination thereof, I think that's really cool. And then, of course, you have all of the subterranean portions of it, whether it's a, you know, a dwarven hold and they forge weapons, or there's a gnomish, uh, gnomish tinkerers that we brought up from uh, Dragonlance living inside, forging uh, gears and things um, out of the, the inner ore, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Even um, criminal organizations taking over one, and we even thought of the idea of a an aquatic setting like it could even be piracy and people sailing using ships inside the basin maybe even at high altitudes um, something else I think for mechanically speaking is that because we do have this weird combination flux or whatever of elemental forces instead of sticking with the classic earth air fire water um, yeah, instead of sticking with the, the the typical earth, air, fire, and water, you could go with like the the quasi elementals. Now I know some of you don't may not remember them, but if you know old Grognard, you remember the quasi elementals that came in uh, after A D and D, where it's like magma, steam, dust, ice, and that kind of thing. Where you have you, you know it's earth and fire mixed together it would make mag magma. So if you mix two elementals, um, elemental forces, you could um, reflavor, reskin a whole lot of like spells and character class features and things of that nature to, um, and you know, just pick options and things to allow you to um, become that kind of character. I mean, an example would be a magma uh, druid doesn't necessarily have to be only earth or fire, but maybe just allow the person to pick the options to to mix and match those options or even clerical domains and things could be like, I want to pick the steam or ice or void um, quasi elemental, which there were two other elemental planes, the positive and negative um, energy planes. But uh, again, over time, it's fifth edition now. And of course you have the pathfinder um, divergence in a lot of um, OSR. So Depending on how deep you want to go into it, you can include those as well. Uh, Dead Man says, Return to the te Temple of Elemental Evil also had a caldera similar to that, though it had towers around the rim built to uh, electrocute any trespassers. I don't remember that from Tel... Oh, it was Return to the Temple of Elemental Evil. Um, I think I remember the original. I don't remember Return to. But, but hell yeah, I mean... It, towers harnessing the power of storms around the outside, and then you have a you have a location on the inside. And like we said, depending on how what kind of dungeon air quotes dungeon you want to run, you could start from the bottom and work your way to the top, or have the PCs scale the outside and start from the top down. And maybe those defensive measures are you have to pass bypass those defensive measures to get inside. Maybe it's been around for so long that some wizard cadre was there doing their experiments and suddenly the uh, the electrical storms that kept everyone at bay, maybe one of the towers has fallen or something, and that's the reason why people can get there. I mean, all kinds of... You have all kinds of stories and such. Um, 
Faulty Doombot says the world is a caldera formed after an ancient mega volcano exploded, forming the island like continents that are its rim. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, ge geologically speaking, yeah, because there are, what is it, our, the surface of our world, our, the crust of the earth is basically liquid. Uh, it moves around and, and things like that. So I suppose you could do that. Uh, now, now, technically, I don't want to say technically speaking. Uh, fantastically speaking, it doesn't really, it doesn't really work that well, um, since the idea of a caldera usually the, the stereotypical idea of a caldera is a big, large peak, kind of looks flat from from a distance. Maybe there's steam flowing from it, and then when you do a helicopter view over top, you see a big round basin, and then you fall on the inside of it. But you're absolutely correct. Um, and and of course, when we talk about science fiction. You know, the idea of a caldera could be on a, I don't know, the, heck, we could have calderas right now in our own solar system on some of our uh, icy moons that have that are filled with, like, ethane or methane gases and such, and, you know, unbreathable atmospheres and, oh, um cryo-volcanoes erupting around, and maybe there's a place where humanity can build inside of a, of a um, possibly active cryo-volcanic region or something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Pat Elgur even says an asteroid impact would be would be more plausible, which, which of course, you know, f sure, humanity's um, blink of an eye existence, we see a big giant, I don't know, mound in the sky when we realize, we didn't realize that, oh, it might have been on a flat plane until something impacted it, impacted it hard enough to cause the land around it to ripple up into a point, um, in, into a point into the sky. So I suppose you could even create a um, a ripple effect caldera. So one uh, large basin and crater on top of another one, on, on inside of another one. So you have concentric circles coming inside, maybe even. Uh, gaining altitude and whatnot, so you could have a ring, a ring, and then land, and then a ring, and water, and then ring, and maybe even fire or something. If you wanted to like uh, make it very fantastical, but I could see, I could see a an impact crater having that kind of effect, or concentric, various concentric rings of different sizes, all interlaced in some kind of strange method, and then turned into uh, a major metropolis, maybe or uh, you know, outside communities trying to move into the location or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. These were big, a big giant punching, a, uh, I don't know, a, a demigod or something decided to punch the ground for some reason. <laughs> or maybe there was a battle and, it, and the demigod landed on the ground and it just created this big giant ripple that, that rippled up around the dead god. And now that's, you know, he's trapped on the inside, um, healing after 10,000 years or something. I don't know. Um, but but the, your origin could come from anywhere. And I, I kind of, but I kind of like it. I kind of like it. Um, also, um, you know, yesterday we did talk about the mixing of like, you know, aerial and aquatic and being, you know, su being in a subterranean Porsche realm where you might have um, purposeful or, or um, natural water elements happening down inside of the subterranean portions with waterfalls and flooded chambers and the <laughs> water slides and the threat of flooding as well as um, magma chambers and poisonous gases and things so on a mechanical level i could see like um yeah pet ogre says they uh they have different formation processes but after a while they they look um they look the same and it's i i, I couldn't i I'm not a geologist, so I couldn't tell you why. Like, what's the difference between a mountainous caldera and something that isn't quite mountainous? I mean, what's the difference between a impact crater and a volcanic crater? But whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Faulty Doombot says, I ah, gotcha, did some light digging. Seems a caldera is specifically a volcano crater. Yeah, it, it's, mind you. We're talking fantasy, right? A bunch of adventurers, they see a caldera, like, um, unless there literally is, like, I don't know, geology taught in your fantasy world, they may not know the difference between one or the other, especially if, and when you're talking 
fantastical elements if something is man-made or was created through some outside force uh would there really be a definition for it mm, i don't think so so the um getting back to um some other mechanical features especially when it comes to uh, character choices and such it's also possible to come up with different environments for the pcs to be um, for backgrounds and PC skill levels. So an example would be um, not just having uh, characters and cultures that are experienced with, say, living on, you know, on the mountainside, but they may also have experience with living on the mountainside and having some aquatic features as well. Um, whether they are truly aquatic and can breathe the water and swim, or they are uh, living on the surface of it through boating and sailing and I don't know, paddling or something like that. I don't know, submarines, if you want to throw something like that in there. Um, it's possible to include something like that. So your stereotypical dwarven culture might have a very nautical theme to it, especially if they live on the uh, upper basin. Or uh, another example would be maybe you have, I don't know, you have like goblinoid uh, tribes or something that live in and around the caldera and some of the goblinoid tribes might have like a very a very heavy volcanic uh heat and volcanic skill set maybe even adaptation but they may also have an aerial adaptation too um, with air balloons or uh, kites and gliders or um, heck even may even be allied with some kind of uh, various winged or aerial creatures and monsters that may live in and around this uh, location. Like going back to going back to the Kraken idea, or any kind of giant monster or something. We've seen we've seen plenty of times where giant monsters live inside of like dragons living inside of volcanoes, or at least the the calderas of where volcanoes are from are created. They they too may also have some kind of relationship to it. Like I could see reskinning and reflavoring a dragon to not just be volcanic and fiery but having a a, a bit of a earth elemental to element to it um an aerial element to it and maybe even an aquatic one so so yeah um yeah uh, uh doomba says uh, are the caldera lakes acidic like hot springs um i think that's based on I think in, in um, our world, I think that's based on situation, right? Um, if they are, like we talked about the idea of a caldera being completely hostile to everything, whether it's uh, acidic lakes or poisonous lakes, like as, um, acid enough to burn through like solid steel or something, possible. Uh, poisonous gases up there that may be just as acidic if, if breathed into the lungs. It could be more poisonous than acidic so that like you could possibly sail put a sailing vessel on the surface of a place but you wouldn't want it to touch any kind of flesh or anything or breathe it in of course there's the possibility that it might be even even if there is a lake it might be too hot to even uh, approach such a place um you, you know me when we get to third pillar thursday we'll be talking about all kinds of things like uh for example i know people get upset about the idea that you know like 90 percent of the mo most races have dark vision so dark vision is um uh it basically makes darkness useless but are you worried about darkness or are you worried about vision because there's whole there's a ton of things that can affect vision that have nothing to do with darkness like again these fall clouds or acidic clouds dark vision doesn't pierce through them but you can still have adversaries hiding in in the clouds of gases or geysers or something that are spewing forth on a, the top of this caldera lake um how um what kinds of, of particulates are down in the lake can you you know if you put your head down in there and, and can survive such a thing is it like muddy and thick or filled with um, mineral deposits and particulates or is it clear and uh, invisible inside i don't know you know and of course th that those kinds of vision things could happen because of say um 
uh, through pressure and geysers happening momentarily or randomly, or maybe the whole thing is just a, a big giant steam vent, <laughs> you know, m many, many kilometers across the, uh, the surface, and you just can't see anything anyway, even if you did do a, like a helicopter vision from above. Or maybe, you know, it could be seasonal as well. I'm sure um, air currents and seasons could affect those things. So maybe there is a, there is a period of time at which... Um, the seasonal changes happen that remove the deadly gases that are that are hovering over the surface of it to just allow the PCs to get there over, I don't know, a three-week period or something like that, you know? Yeah, uh, Doomba says, uh, a caldera could be a hot spring attraction for dragons. Uh, of course, uh, heck, if I was a dragon and I knew most, most, if not all of humanity, could never get to me, and I got a great place to lay some eggs or something like that, hell yeah, nice and warm and, and that kind of stuff. Now, it depends on, uh, again, here we go with size uh, ratios. I mean, is a caldera the size of a nest, like a bird's nest for a dragon? Or is this caldera so large that maybe there's a, um, an island chain in the top of the caldera and the dragon just lives in one of them? Who knows? Um, um, we ended yesterday with the idea of having a, like, dragons battling over the the territory of a place. Um, oftentimes would you, especially when you read the, the, the we as tabletop role-playing gamers, we love to get to the end of our equations a lot of times. And I feel like sometimes we pass by, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, um, sometimes we pass by the interesting parts to hurry up and get to the ultimate outcome. Um, like um, uh, Ogre says, uh, for a great worm, it, it, could be, <laughs> it could be one nest. That's a pretty scary idea. Yeah, talking about the size of a, like a, an ancient great worm would probably just be like, oh, this is, oh, I'm going to use the outer rim as my pillow and just curl up on the inside, <laughs> which I don't know how scary it would be to get a, get a helicopter view of a caldera and find out that there's like a dragon literally curled up on the inside of it. Like, holy, you know, and, and what size and um, scale that would be. Maybe even, you know, bordering past ancient dragon and more close to demigod, although I think ancient dragons and demigods are supposed to be, like, synonymous with each other. So, so hell yeah. And, um, but in dragon lore, there has always been this, uh, this animosity between the different dragon, and I'm only going to refer to our classic ten, right? The chromatic dragons, the ones that have colors, and the metallic dragons, the ones that are fall along the sides of different uh, minerals. And there's been a contention between chromatic and metallic, as well as the fact that when dragons are very territorial, and their territory can stretch probably dozens, if not hundreds of miles away from their locations. So, but we often don't see the see that conflict it's usually a past tense kind of thing um and i could see a ton of different types of dragon kind battling over if calderas are rare enough or maybe every caldera is a haven i could see them battling over it you know green and uh green and black dragons battling over the acidic lakes that are filled with like algae and moss and fungus or something i could see the you know of course the the, the capital size red dragons wanting to dominate the caldera and, you know, living off of the, the um, volcanic uh, fumes and and uh, flow from beneath the caldera. I could see something more aquatic wanting to live there or um, earthen elemental also wanting to take the spot. And maybe the big red has pissed off enough of its own dragon kind to, you know, enemy of my enemy kind of thing where... Maybe there is even some metallics that are looking at the chromatics and like, you know what? I we all don't like that, like the crimson, crimson queen or something like that. You know, let's let's take her out and you know maybe it's not us. Maybe we'll we'll attract uh, uh, attract allies to do it for us. So that might be kind of cool too to have to have a uh, you know dragon's lair 
dragon lance kind of thing to dispose of whatever dragon is there, knowing, maybe the PC's even knowing, like, okay, we've got this monstrous big red that's terrorizing everything, so yes, we need these other dragons as our allies, but when the red is dead, who takes over, you know? Yeah, Faulty says, uh, I mean, if Caldera's um, are where the element are where the elements meet, I could see dragons using them as wellsprings um, to bathe and to restore their power. Yeah, we, we, we talked about having some sort of uh, MacGuffin. And, and I, don't mean to, I, I don't mean to be silly on, on the idea of, of a MacGuffin, but essentially there's something in the caldera, uh, maybe in the surface or in the lake, uh, subterranean or something, and dragons have been uh, commonly known to to only live because they draw so much power, and that's one of the reasons why that they um, they slumber so much. And so a caldera could be a, could be like we think they're bathing out of some kind of joy, but it could be how much magic it is that they have, and in order to it's almost like a ley line, right? They have to literally bathe in, in the waters of the caldera or at least sit there because it is the culmination of magical forces and honestly if we if we go with the four elements thing it it may make sense in an elemental f- form that they represent the uh the confluence of the power of the four elements brought together and um i don't know i suppose you could have some, um a uh, dragon with elemental allies, I suppose, if you wanted to do that and and do some like little um, Russian stacking doll BFF kind of creatures, or uh, maybe it's strange. Strangely enough, the dragons are the ones that have been been bringing about elemental balance, because without them, maybe things might go into chaos, and you might have something like that. Yeah, but but yeah, dragons. Uh, well, and doesn't necessarily need to be only dragons, but uh, but dragons absorbing the power that is in the caldera itself could be co- pretty awesome. And what a great way to, if you don't want to have the adventurers going to the caldera, but they just happen to exist, what a great way to have a, um, like, a divinity on Earth, right? Dragons kind of represent that, where, where uh, of course, we, you know, PCs love themselves some warlocks, but... Um, warlock patrons, clerical powers. You could you could absolutely reskin and reflavor a community around the idea of dragons themselves, um, the Calderas being their home, and the character classes representative of those who are devoted to such great powers or trying to take down such great powers. Either way, right? So, um. I, I suppose there would be some other mechanical things that you can play with in terms of calderas. Uh, I yes, I know I'm going to be flowing with this in, in third pillar Thursday, but you know, I I don't feel both in the real world and in our gaming world that we would like to see our calderas be static. Right? Um, they are exotic, but they should be dangerous in some way, shape, or form. So. The, the idea of PCs needing to scale the outside and needing to worry about um, falling rocks and heights and um, maybe even, um, I don't know, rock slides and mud slides and things worry about on the outside, as well as the fact that you may have, um, of course, you have the whole aquatic thing, whether it's acidic, poisonous, um, the aquatic flow that happens on the inside of the mountain. And so... Being able to pull from our uh, spell-like effects, pull from our traps, and creating these little uh, puzzle, uh, mac- um, I don't want to say puzzle machines, but like the idea that in order to in order to explore the place, the PCs may need to uh, manipulate and use and learn about the environment to their their benefit in order to go from one place to another. Like. Um, learning the timing of the of these um, geysers that are spewing out hot steam, or learning about the, the the earth shakes every seven hours or something, so we got to be prepared. Or um, 
the acidic lake is very dangerous. Yes, we can sail on it, but there's only certain materials that are allowed that um, uh, floating vessels are created from. And so we have to be, be aware of the outer skin of the floating vessels because they only last for a short amount of time, but they're, they're needed to get to the islands that exist on, inside of the caldera or something like that. So it's kind of like rewarding, their, rewarding the PC's exploration. You know what I mean? Uh, um, uh, uh, Faulty Doombot says, sounds like Eastern dragon deities. It could be. It, it could very well be um, if, the, if, if you wanted to go far more um, social Eastern flavor serpentine type of dragons, but not necessarily. Uh, I mean, it does sound like that, but you can pull from that and do more of our classic six-limbed dragons, you know, more uh, thick in the body, uh, sh shorter, thicker in the body, and with like maybe horns or something like that. Um, yeah, it doesn't. That, that's <laughs> we it, we don't have to limit ourselves to our imaginations at all. So, and dra we don't even have to limit ourselves to dragons. I mean, considering that a a caldera um, is part of a, um, a part of a larger elemental. Um, power we can still pull up, pull from our elemental um, entities like the afrit and jinn um there's plenty of no kitty there's <laughs> i love you too all right there's plenty of uh of outsiders that the the membrane between worlds may be something that's in, interesting to pull from so we don't have to limit ourselves to what we what our ideals are when it comes to um, using a caldera. Um, calderas could be a, could very easily be a portal between a place here and there, right? Like if you're using, heck, if you've got uh, old Planescape, you know, you've got old Planescape um, materials, you could just very easily say, well, I'm going to use the the statistics from Planescape and, and say that the caldera is this place, right? So, yeah. Kitty, 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 kitty. Really? Really, kitty? <laughs> <sighs> Sorry, guys, but I do have... Oh, come on, kitty. Uh, yeah. I know where you're trying to go. You're trying to get above my head. <sighs> Sorry, guys. I had... <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is life with a cat. It's just like, uh, I know you're involved in something, and that's a problem. <laughs> anyway, um, heck, just like, um, since we're talking about cats and things like that, um, uh, I, there, there's a little bit of, of, uh, cat-like attitudes with some of our um, larger dragons and stuff because it's all about them. So I suppose my cat is uh, trying to sell in in her caldera as, as we speak. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, some more mechanical effects as well that we can pull from when, it, uh, when we talk about calderas and, and some of the um, mixed, mixed elemental forces are like we could especially when it comes to like spell effects and spell-like effects in our monsters and things, you could combine um, one or more traits from different elements. So for example, instead of something like, for example, there are lower level spells that create like a fall cloud, but if you want something more um, acidic, you know, an acid cloud makes a lot of sense or a poisonous cloud makes a lot of sense or heck, you could even, even change the the damage source of one thing from one thing to another. So, for example, um, maybe some of the the various clouds inside of the, the the upper surface of the caldera aren't just acidic or poisonous, but maybe they're like necrotic or something, or even um, cryogenic in their in their disposition. You know, and uh, like I've always said, maybe all of the spells, not all of them. That's a little facetious. Um, may, maybe many of the spell effects, especially if they're elemental in our gaming books, aren't unique. Maybe they are truly pulled from the environment itself. So like a meteor swarm is a, is the spell effect of a meteor swarm might be a real meteor swarm. So 
since we're talking about all four elements in the uh, in a caldera, you know, a, a wall of fire when you're sailing across the uh, the upper lake of the caldera might literally be flip 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 go to the book oh that's a wall of fire and pff, it's a big giant wall of fire and you already have statistics for that and um so i could see doing things of that nature um maybe even combining something like um like lava while it has very many states uh, lava has very many states um having lava spilled on top of a surface or you know, an NPC or one of the PCs, not only does it burn, but it also adheres and, like, restrains or grapples um, an individual. So you could have, like, you could take your classic oozes, which are already dangerous in and of themselves, and then reskin them as, like, maybe, like, uh, instead of acidic, they could be burning like lava. You could uh, reskin or reflavor them. Maybe, maybe there are things that are living in the aerial reaches. So you could have gaseous creatures out there um, maybe even pulling off of some other monsters like like uh, air elementals and ghosts and uh ethereal creatures living up in the upper reaches of the of the sky so there are ways to to find the mechanical features you might, might want to look for by just reskinning reflavoring and reusing the things you already have so that you already have a basis for like uh, balance and things of that nature and of course you already have most role-playing games have a really really good robust engine so you could pull from that as well just a bunch of d20s if you're using a d20 system that kind of thing um, <laughs> uh, faulty doombot says uh, could a caldera act as an elemental nexus or ley line and increase the effects and damage of elemental spells or cause magic users to roll on the wild magic chart uh, I would I would probably say both, either or or both. Like they don't, it doesn't need to be one or the other. But I could see something like that. Now, for me, um, I I love a p policy of give and take. So you don't necessarily have to say like, okay, well, since you're in the caldera, all of your elemental abilities are are more powerful. End of story. I would love the idea of they could be more powerful. But there's a chance something might go wild, right? So you, you could have a, you could either base it on arcane skill, um, i.e., rolling the d20, and the higher you roll, the better, the better effect you have in drawing on that vast power. Um, the the lower the roll, the more you you open up the conduit to yourself, and then you receive like a flood of that power, and then have like a wild magic chart. And again, I, I think that, okay, the, the base wild magic chart is a little bit ridiculous in my opinion. That, that's just me. Um, some people like a lot of comedy and, and uh, chaos in their gaming, but I feel like you could make your own wild magic chart, maybe D6 to a D12 kind of thing, D20 even, and have other various effects. For example... And, and do it in such a way that if you want to make it more um, thematic or even, even, even more uh, cinematic in your setting, like an example would be um, someone casts a spell, but it goes out of their control. Um, in terms of it extends, I use my magic missile and my, you know, I use a, well, let's go more uh, elemental. I... Uh, you know, shoot an acid arrow or something, or my burning hand spell or something, you could roll in a chart and it, it's like, okay, well, you cast it the first round and guess what? It keeps pouring out of you uh, for the next 1d4 rounds or something. Or the, the elemental effect becomes like a living spell. And so the minute you, you cast the spell, now it's like a sentient creature and it has the capabilities of the spell you just cast plus couple of stats or something and so now it's like a living spell or maybe you become you know you we have a huge chart of conditions so maybe someone becomes stunned or blinded or incapacitated paralyzed exhausted so you can use a ton of of conditions um maybe that wild magic works to their favor as well so maybe they don't expend a spell slot or it's easier for the person to 
um, get back a spell slot, or maybe the spell is maximized, they roll maximum damage, or, you know, you could do, um, um, advantage on other die rolls, right, um, you roll for damage, okay, roll again, and pick the, pick the highest number or something, you know, or roll twice as many dice, and, you know, whatever the case may be, it depends on how complicated you want to make it, but, yeah, I could see something like that, and, and, we, not only would we want the PCs to interact with our world this way, you, you, I think it behooves us to have some story to it. So maybe if the PCs are using elemental forces, maybe they draw their own adversaries towards them. So, you know, salamanders and magmen and fire elementals and um, earthen, I don't know, zorns or whatever are drawn towards the elemental forces that the PCs use. So that, that could be good. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Dead Man. Yeah, like Dead Man's talk, um, and, um, uh, talking about for a great worm, it would be, it could be one nest, like uh, one of the monsters in a Godzilla um, panoply. Like the whole, the whole, the majority of the Godzilla monsters came out of like, like volcanoes and you know, came out of the earth and whatnot, and so a caldera could be a the birthplace of your kaiju if you want to have them. Um, there's nothing stopping a uh, the the classic Tarask, which is not quite as classic as people make it seem to be. But yeah, there's nothing stopping a Tarask from give having been born from a caldera and then is climbing out of it or something. So heck yeah, and and of course. Size categories in Dungeons and Dragons have always been one of these um, nebulous things, uh, far beyond. Like there, there are words associated with size categories, but depending on the edition of Dungeons and Dragons you use, those size categories can be more or less important. So depending on the size of the monster you're thinking of and the caldera, the size of the caldera, it, it might not make a lot of sense for the PCs to even be able to, no, no matter their power, to take down, like, a, a kaiju of a certain size, right? Like, um, you know, a, a, a great worm that you've decided that is six kilometers long it's a little ridiculous to hit it with a long sword, right? Like, there, you, you might make this creature, instead of statting the creature out, because, you know, if you stat it, they'll kill it. And yes, you could very easily just go, well, I'll just give, give it 5,000 hit points or something, which is easy, it's easy, but it's also boring. Um, you could make a creature of that size um, a, a an environmental effect, that is the backdrop to stopping the thing, and the PCs are on a quest to stop the thing through other means. Uh, very much like a lot of movies and things, right? You have a big monster out there, PCs really have no ability to stop the monster, but they do have the ability to get the clues and elements together to stop the monster, whether it's like gathering, you know, going out and gathering the MacGuffins to bring them all together to do the thing that stops the thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like, man. I think most anime, um, um, main characters would disagree with you. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, especially with those, you know, the idea of big old Buster swords and and uh, action lines and um, and uh, anime screaming involved in it. Probably, probably a lot of anime screaming and uh and jumping in the air for extended periods of time hell yeah now um, now mind you depends on what kind of of uh thematic theme you're going for like if you just really don't care and you're just like yeah i'm a little i'm a, a grain of rice against an elephant sure um then it doesn't really matter then you can go very cinematic with it and just absorb just accept it which fifth edition dungeons and dragons is is very cinematic based uh it's very high action over the top um uh relatability rather than more you know it's it's not very grounded so it makes a lot of sense to do something like that now with um if 
going back to the wild magic elemental powers kind of thing, it's also a possibility that maybe there are ways or regions to, um, through the power of the PCs, they might be able to do things in this um, confluence of elemental forces that they normally wouldn't be able to. So an example would be um, being able to fly on geothermal vents or um, somehow finding something that allows them to navigate through the subterranean um, passageways in, in, in and around the, the caldera or something. Or, I don't know, there, there may be some things they could gather around them, like maybe there's a specific type of plant and using the fibers from the plant protects them from the heat or whatnot. Like there may be things they could discover and that would allow them to explore your dangerous location, which, which is one of the reasons why um, you, we often see in a, in a seasonal manner, someone brings up, hey, has anyone run a, run a setting that's all aquatic and underwater and how would you do it? And of course the idea is, well, do, do you force the PCs to find a way to breathe underwater or do you give it to them to get them underwater in the first place and then let it go from that point on so yeah um so depending on what kind of mechanics you want to add into it you could just say all right here pcs you have an airship and the airship takes you up to the top of the caldera and and you know you only have a certain amount of time to be up there and hope and pray that the airship doesn't catch on fire or melt away through acid or something like that when you escape and steal the MacGuffins on the inside and get your treasure and, and get the hell out of there, right? So you could give them uh, some method to to get into the place in the first place. Now, uh, an equal and opposite note, it could be that the PCs are there your setting could be one in which the PCs live in and around a caldera, and this is where they're, it's a way of life for them. So um, definitely tomorrow for World Building Wednesday, and I love World, World Building Wednesday, we're going to talk about building a setting or setting in which people like the caldera is the thing that is the the... The, the main location that the PCs will be in and, and is the, the one place where humanity or the humanoids are able to live and survive and such. So there, there's also the possibility that this isn't the location of the big bad evil guy. It, it's possible that you're, you've designed your setting so the entire world uh, that the PCs um, interact with is only the caldera. And so you could have your... Um, your outer basin location, your inner islands maybe, maybe there's some aerial features you have in this location, and of course your subterranean, um, your outer skin portion, a mountainous portion, then your inner portion, the subterranean tunnels and such. And so based on where you're from or what you're adapted to, you may give the player characters uh, some kind of capabilities to allow them to live there. So for example, Maybe there is a natural, I'm trying to think of something like, um, there are, there's a fungus or plant matter, or maybe even as a character option, like um, my character is someone that, I don't know, has feather fall once every short rest or something like that, right? Because they've been adapted to the air elemental part. Um, of course, we have like the Genasi fit perfectly well in and around the caldera, although maybe player characters can pick some kind of feats or maybe you just grant them certain abilities because you know that they're going to need these things for your setting, right? So um, having a burrowing speed, you know, every short or long rest or, you know, having a resistance to fire that can be turned on and off or something or is, is more concentration-based or something or... Um, um, you know, having a PC that can hold their breath for a long time may be a trait that the PCs can pick. Like, here are three traits, each for earth, air, fire, or water. You get to pick one, and then we're going to move on from there. And that, that way, you're not putting your PCs behind the eight ball. Of course, 
you could completely ignore all that and wait for them to get to a level that's high enough for them to <laughs> figure out some kind of way to breathe poisonous gases and I don't know ascend I don't know, I don't know mountainous terrain and whatnot and you know once it, once you start heading above like fifth level they're going to have capabilities that are going to be pretty pretty amazing pretty superhero level um, so we may not have too many difficulties with that um, also when we talk about like mechanics in the game uh, be aware of be aware of aftermath effects uh, an example is you know we we love the proverbial fireball but we often don't think about the the results of casting a fireball setting setting fire to things uh, maybe uh, burning away all the oxygen um, the the residue that's left over because other other sentient creatures will see the burn mark from a fireball and the dead bodies and thing you know dead bodies are just a whole nother aftermath concept but in a caldera it may be quite important to keep track of a lot of the of the side effects i mean a, a pc that somehow has the power to destroy a huge chunk of the outer basin might cause the lake to drain over time spilling down the side of the caldera um, we talked about being in the subterranean realm beneath the lake and either having uh you know causing damage and causing the inner portions of the subterranean realm to flood with the lake if damage is done to the ceiling you could have uh, other kinds of aquifers trapped in there with uh, trapped liquid under pressure behind stone you could have maybe there's something flammable like for example you could have a, a number of different types of um, hazards where there's like flammable gases and so the you know starting a fire around one of these geysers or poison gas fissures or something like that might not be a smart thing because not only may you light yourself on fire but you may ignite a pocket of poison or not poison gas but flammable gas um and igniting that gas might ignite that gas permanently when i say permanently it might last dozens of years and after setting it on fire it just blasts out heat and flame and then now the pcs have just trapped themselves down a certain cavern and this flame is just blasting out of there like a flamethrower for you know ever and always um amen right so um having some kind of like keeping track of some of the aftermath effects same thing goes with like yesterday we talked about maybe there's some kind of algae or growth happening inside the caldera that's spreading you know far too rapidly and maybe the pcs you know use some kind of poison or corruption or stop the spread of a of a vegetation disease or any 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 number of those things could be happening and it could spread it could stop the spread of something maybe it's very maybe something is feeding off of the the moss or fibers or algae that the pcs have just disrupted uh, again if there's if the dr pcs are going up in the caldera and there's a dragon or some kind of e something even bigger that's laid eggs disrupting those eggs could could call upon this massive creature to come back sooner than the pcs want it um and, and so on and so forth right like uh if you have whole communities up there how do the pcs interact with them maybe there's a type of culture up there that's so alien to the pcs that they communicate they don't communicate with voice or sound or something maybe they communicate with some kinds of like colors or they communicate with um with using different kinds of thermal imagery or something i don't know um some cre some alien we've thought thought of some alien creatures uh, communicating through um pheromone release and whatnot so you can make this the inner basin of the caldera very very alien and um take it in very many different kinds of ways um including changing the the environment in which a lot of your um, your big nasties live in so like let's take something like a treant you know a living tree uh, pretty much universally the first thing we think of is a 
is a pretty major tree in like a woodland area, but maybe up in the caldera, it's more root roots and moss more so than a tree. And the roots extend down into the waters and that are trying to extend down into the rock beneath the, the waters that are below or something. So, or maybe there's some kind of like basilisk or something that lives in and around the caldera. And I don't know, the basilisk like, you know, climbs rocky surfaces. And if it stares at you, you're turned into some kind of like crystalline monolith or something i don't know like you could really reskin and reflavor a number of uh creatures and give them maybe more of an elemental effect to them uh even if it even if it's only temporary like maybe that basilisk has glider wings and it's able to glide on geothermals and to flow from one peak um around the other basin to the other peak or something and the pcs are like oh damn it uh uh, not only do I have to close my eyes and not look this thing in the eye, but it can fly like, oh, no, you know, so um, maybe there are like, I don't know, like gargoyles. This is, this is the perfect home for them or something. And uh, and of course, they. Sorry, my mind just went to. Uh, as you guys know, I, I segue quite a bit, but my mind just went to like outer outer world creatures whether they come whatever plane of existence they come from coming into our world through the caldera so that the lots of bits and pieces from the other world exist so that from the outside the caldera looks like a abounded territory but when you cross into the basin the inner portion of the basin is larger than would it would seem from the outside so the in let's say that i coming up with a number the inside of the basin is three kilometers across okay you, you measure it from one peak to the other but when you go inside the basin you pierce the cloud cover it could be hundreds thousands of kilometers of territory inside so that basically scaling the outside going over the jagged walls um uh peaks and then going down into the inside might lead you to another realm of existence and each caldera could be their its own world right um <laughs> oh man um uh ogre says i just thought of a sulfurina uh if you guys like anime and manga i can recommend dr stone in that manga uh not sure if they're um, there's an anime yet the main characters need to retrieve sulfuric acid from a spring such springs can be quite common in a caldera or other volcanic territory yeah i mean heck just the idea of going to up into a caldera to gather elements right sulfuric acid or um certain kinds of mineral deposits or um i don't know getting hematite to form it into some kind of like magnetic gemstone or something for a magic item or something i i'm down with that i'm, I'm definitely down with that although pcs and sulfuric acid not sure exactly how safe it would be to gather it and bring it back with you but but that's the fun part right um anyway uh, uh, ogre goes on to say uh, those springs are extremely dangerous we're talking to an absurd level the springs cause a deadly poisonous gas consisting of hydrogen hydrogen sulfide and sulfuric dioxide oops uh to form and that gas is heavier than air so when you bend over to pick up a rock you might not even be able to get up again because you're dead 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 <laughs> yeah uh why the hell not you know heck um i suppose getting knocked prone might not be as as a uh, as a brush aside as as some players might think especially if that green gas Green, greenish i don't know gas is circling around everyone's ankles and they're like why do my ankles burn feels funny but okay and then all of a sudden the monk kicks somebody and knocks them prone and all of a sudden their flesh flesh flows off of their bones as they as their lungs burn from the inside out or something oh man uh faulty Doomba says a dr stone anime came out a few seasons ago really good show cool um the manga's up to chapter 149. Jesus. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dead Man. I, I hadn't heard of that, but maybe I'll check it out. You know? Um, I can imagine 
heck, I could imagine uh, the a uh, alchemist, uh, alchemy being a alchemist slash art artificer, artificer, um, having con contentions over Caldera and going to a place to gather elements for their their alchemical concoctions and heck if you want to if you want to go less uh less tribal more uh technological i could see something like that happening where you have various factions or hell just even even individuals that are trying to exploit the 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 various uh, chemical concoctions there and we can we can circle all the way back to the to the wild magic chart that if you're if you're one of these um uh chemists in this world trying to gather these elements and not knowing that there are good properties but they also might have dangerous properties you could even have like randomized dangerous properties happen by utilizing these uh chemicals um, outside of a lab or something, I could see something like that. Hell, you could even, heck, you could even reskin or reflavor a bunch of monsters, making them chemical monsters. Um, not sure what you would look up, but there are lots of uh, minerals, liquids, and gases that are quite dangerous today. I don't know, you, hydrogen sulfide, mercury, um, sulfuric acid, so on and so forth, and then make monsters based off of those chemicals. So it's not a, maybe it's not a black pudding or a gray ooze, but it is um, a mercury ooze or a, I don't know, uranium elemental <laughs> or something like, you. if you wanted to go like, um, like mix and match some like really dangerous chemical compounds and and form creatures out of them. I think that'd be kind of cool. Like, w w um, before we get out of here, what what kind of dangerous gas would be a really cool dragon breath weapon? Like, um, uh, I don't know, maybe something like, um, uh, I'm I'm trying to think of something maybe flammable or acidic that would. Uh, I can't think of a really good chemical compound. <laughs> yeah, Faulty Doombot says, oof, a radioactive elemental sounds terrifying. Yeah, it actually sounds kind of cool to me. I'm sorry, but it does, <laughs> right? Like, okay, what kind of... I don't recognize the color of that dragon. What is it? Yeah, Godzilla's atomic breath. <laughs> yeah, rip. <laughs> Blowing down another monster's throat. Yep. Yeah, uh, sorry about the, uh, sorry about the snotty there, but yeah. <laughs> I don't recognize the dragon. What's the dragon? Well, well, there are actually six types of dragons. There's, uh, uranium and plutonium and, er, it's like, what the hell? <laughs> um, may, maybe that might be, we might leave that for chlorine trifluoride. A chlorine, yeah, uranium elementals exist in D and D. Yeah, I, I, I know they do, Debbie. And I'm, and uh, not only are there some official ones, there's a whole bunch of like third party ones too. Um, yeah, if the fire doesn't get you, the cancer will. <laughs> yeah, I, I hit the dragon with my sword. Okay, roll for cancerous. What? <laughs> well, you got close to him, and you know, hell, after watching, um. The uh, the Chernobyl series, yeah, no thank you. <laughs> yeah, roll for <laughs> ah, roll roll roll. What is that? A ninety eight prostate cancer? Sorry, buddy. <laughs> My barbarian's got what? Don't don't worry about it. Um, your cleric will it'll put you through chemo. It's no big deal. Um, yeah, chlor. Uh, chlorine um, trifluoride will set fire to everything. Yeah, there's there's some some chemicals out there that like you cannot put them out once it once it's ignited. Like you, water won't do it. It'll just burn straight through. It's crazy, but yeah, um, causes concrete to burn. Yeah, uh, um, <laughs> game masters like roll for save from the dragon breath weapon. You know what? Never. Don't even bother rolling for a save. You, you just die. <laughs> uh, let's see. You take 1d6 fire damage. PC's like, big deal. N 
No, I don't, I don't think you understand. You're going to take 1d6 fire damage forever. <laughs> yeah, it's going to burn right down to the bone. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you see dragon <laughs> roll death save. <laughs> uh, ooh, pure sodium will cause an explosion if submerged in water. You know, we, we might have to do a whole... We're going to save this. We're going to save this thing. We're going to have to do a whole week on chemical interactions and some of the craziest, wildest, coolest, most lethal, dangerous chemical interactions from our real world chemicals and like translate them over into like um, gaming effects and stuff. That's 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 a cool that's a cool concept. I like that. I like that a lot. So, yep. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Pet Ogre. Setting fire to glass, the nope chemical that is chlorine trifluoride. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Alchemy. Hell yeah. Of course, Tess. So, yeah, we'll do that. So, anyway, guys, um, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, tomorrow, of course, we continue our discussion of... We will be continuing our discussion of the Caldera. Tomorrow is World Building Wednesday. Thursday is Third Pillar of Exploration. Um... Uh, th third pillar exploration Thursday and then of course we have ourselves future Friday so please tune in then and by the way um, again like uh, if you like this long form unscripted kind of off the cuff uh, talk you know like uh, like talking around the uh, the gaming table uh, please like share subscribe follow over on Twitch um, heck join the discord server we're down in the boiler room each and every day um, so other than that guys thank you very much have a great one I'll see you later bye have a great day.